Hello, everyone. Today's topic is hikikomori, what Buddha taught for shut-ins. Some of you who are watching might be struggling with being a hikikomori or shut-in, or maybe you're the worried relative of a shut-in. Today, I'd like to talk about something Buddha taught that can help you. I think you will benefit from hearing this Buddhist teaching. Now, I have a Japanese online community called the Reiwa Temple where people can candidly ask questions about Buddhism and I will answer them. Many people on there who regularly listen to Buddhism either have experienced being shut-ins or are currently shut-ins. Among them, a fair few actually gained a bond with Buddhism because they were shut-ins. In fact, Sakyamuni Buddha himself experienced a state of mind similar to a shut-in before attaining enlightenment, and it actually pushed him towards attaining enlightenment. One major reason why people may become shut-ins is that they feel their lives have no meaning. Buddhism brings clarity and light precisely for those with this troubled, dark state of mind. So I'd really recommend that anyone struggling with being a shut-in take a listen to what Buddha taught. Today I will talk about these three things. 1. Being a shut-in can lead to gaining a bond with Buddhism. 2. Buddha too came to a stop. 3. The solution offered by Buddhism. Here we have some statistics on shut-ins in Japan. According to info from the Cabinet Office in March 2023, there are presently about 1,460,000 shut-ins in Japan. A shut-in is broadly defined as someone who doesn't leave their house or their room except to perhaps buy groceries or engage in a pastime. Current data shows that there are about 1,460,000 of these people of working age between ages 15 to 64 in Japan. Reasons for becoming a shut-in include not being able to adjust to school life, being unable to make friends in class, and not being able to trust one's teachers. These kinds of things lead to absences from school, which can progress into that person becoming a shut-in. As for people who had been employed, Reasons for becoming a shut-in include an overly harsh working environment, power harassment, and shock from being harshly reprimanded by a superior. Initially, the person might take time off from work and seek to change their place of employment, but unable to find anything, they end up a shut-in. Others may successfully change jobs, but then the new job doesn't go well either, so they retreat again to their rooms. These are just some examples amongst all the many shut-ins. The coronavirus pandemic especially contributed to a great increase in school refusals. As for those who become shut-ins due to difficulties with employment, their numbers seem to have leveled off. But since the pandemic, there's been a surge in school refusals. Also, more than half of all shut-ins stay shut-ins for more than seven years. Of course, that must worry their families, but it's especially hard on the shut-ins themselves. Sometimes people come to me saying their daughter is a shut-in, but more often than not, I hear of people's sons being shut-ins. Mothers will sometimes come to discuss this, saying they want their adult children to actually act like adults and get a job, and that they can't take care of them forever. I really understand their concerns though it seems that they're far from the only ones with this problem. Actually, the reason why I made shut-ins the topic today was that, amongst the people whose questions I've answered in my online Buddhist community, several people have said they were shut-ins for a time. Some who are currently shut-ins have said that the Buddhist teachings provide them with light. As I hear these people coming out about their experiences, I feel so glad for them that they were able to encounter Buddhism. The misery of being a shut-in pushed them to listen to Buddhism, which is now helping them. This even makes them feel grateful for having that experience as a shut-in in the first place. 
When I think of just how many people in Japan alone are struggling with being a shut-in, I feel a renewed desire to convey the Buddhist teachings to as many people as possible. Some of the shut-ins, or former shut-ins, who are now listening to Buddhism gained their interest in Buddhism after watching my videos. They were able to spend time watching YouTube in the first place because they had that time free. Something in my videos must have caught their interest and revealed something to them about themselves, which made them want to hear more. This then led them to join my community. For them, being shut-ins provided them with the time to stop and think about things, which led them to develop a bond with Buddhism. That experience then became a positive, something to be grateful for. Because we're so busy, we hardly ever get the chance to think seriously about life. One of Master Renyo's letters speaks of deeply considering the transiency of human beings, contemplating the truth of our existence. This is something we don't really get the chance to actually do. Our planners are crammed with obligations from morning till evening. We have to maintain our household, we have to go to work, and we have to attend to countless other tasks. Each day is spent crossing off checklists. We're preoccupied with the quotas we have to meet and the things we have to get done by the end of each month, and so we're just constantly busy, day in, day out. Because of this, we don't have the time to sit and have a good, hard ponder about our lives. Master Renyo taught that human life is transient, like a floating weed swept this way and that way. We rush about busily, and then life ends. Sometimes, though, we do have to stop and think. One side effect of being a shut-in is gaining that time to stop and think, but that's not the only thing that can leave people with a lot of thinking time. Some experience it as school refusals. Others may find that retirement gives them that time. Others still may find themselves pondering life while hospitalized. Being out of work for a time because you got fired or your business didn't take off can leave you with a lot of time to think as well. I think a lot of people who listen to my Buddhist lectures now had these sorts of reasons for becoming interested in Buddhism. If they'd stayed constantly on the go, they probably wouldn't have ended up wanting to listen to Buddhism. When people become drawn to Buddhism precisely because they had that chance to stop and think seriously about life, they end up feeling grateful for that experience. Let's say someone has an identity crisis, where they lose their grip on their sense of self and don't know what exactly it is they should be aiming for anymore. It's painful and frightening, but if that experience leads to them listening to and benefiting from the Buddhist teachings, the person may feel thankful that it happened. Sakyamuni Buddha himself actually had a time when he no longer knew what he should do in life and came to a stop. In fact, to others, he seemed like a shut-in. Before Sakyamuni attained full enlightenment and so became a Buddha, his name was Siddhartha Gautama. As the son of a king, Prince Siddhartha received a first-rate education to prepare him for the throne. His father, King Sadhodana, had very high hopes for him. The famed fortune teller, Asita predicted that Prince Siddhartha would become a Chakravartin, which is a great king who will rule over the entire world, so extraordinary was this child. The king, therefore, had the finest teachers in the country educate him on literary and military arts. It turned out Prince Siddhartha was just as outstandingly gifted as everyone hoped, so the king, his ministers, and everyone in the land had great expectations for his future. However, as he grew up, he would often have times when he was lost in deep thought. One thing that contributed to this was the plowing festival. The plowing festival is a celebration that takes place in spring and involves the soil being dug up in order to cultivate the field. When this festival began in Prince Siddhartha's land, the king put a hoe into the soil, and then a little earthworm crawled out of the hole. 
the worm was suddenly grabbed by a small bird. When that bird flew up into the sky, an eagle came swooping down from way up high and caught the small bird in its sharp talons. Seeing this chain of events, the Festivalgers all let out gasps of awe. It's a rare thing to see a worm get snatched up by a bird and then also see that bird be caught by an eagle after all. For Prince Siddhartha, however, it was a shock. It showed him that in the animal realm, the strong prey on the weak. The weak become food and are eaten by the strong. In other words, the weak are kept down by the strong. The weak are eaten. The strong eat the weak. That is the harsh law of the jungle. But Prince Siddhartha realized that it doesn't only apply to animals. Human beings are just the same. As the son of a king and a member of the royal family, Prince Siddhartha had a number of obedient retainers to do his bidding. If the king got angry or someone made a mistake, he might punish retainers with a lashing or even death. Prince Siddhartha realized his own father did things like ordering people killed for these reasons or sending soldiers out to war. His own family, the strong, was royalty and held great power, and his father looked down on his retainers, the weak. This is what seeing the worm and birds made the prince realize. He also realized how many concubines his father kept. Although these people were lower in status, Prince Siddhartha wondered how his father could treat them so badly when they were just as human as him. The prince had abundant opportunities to see how unreasonable this sort of thing was. So he began to wonder why the world, both of animals and of humans, was so cruel. Buddhism teaches that this world is an impure one, defiled by the blind passions, a world where everyone fights with each other and hurts each other because of greed, anger, jealousy, and envy. When I was a child, I had a similar experience to Prince Siddhartha. Near the gates of my elementary school, there was a duck pond. A number of ducks lived there, and one of them kept being bullied by the others. They kept pecking at its head to the point where it had gone bald. When I was passing by, I'd usually see that duck being bullied. I'd always think, so animals bully each other too, huh? That's so sad. Poor thing. It's just the same as with people. In my class, too, there was a kid who kept being bullied. It was really spiteful. Kids would avoid talking to him and even avoided touching his desk. I came to the awful realization that humans and animals were just the same when it came to cruelty and that this kind of thing would keep on repeating forever. So I feel like I understand how Prince Siddhartha felt at the plowing festival. Siddhartha also had the thought that once he became king, he too would end up oppressing those beneath him, and he wondered, what meaning was there in a life like that? There was also the fact that next to his kingdom of Kapilavastu was the large kingdom of Kosala, and the residents of Kapilavastu lived in constant fear of being invaded by Kosala. So this plowing festival, which took place when Prince Siddhartha was 12 years old, was what prompted him to consider this. Once he completed his elite education and become king, he too would end up oppressing those weaker than him and fearing those stronger than him. How much peace of mind and happiness would he really have then? What meaning was there in becoming a great king? As we saw before, parents expect their children to grow up to get hired by a good company. For that, the children will need to get into a good university, which will require them to go to school and study hard. So parents of school-age shut-ins pressure their children to accomplish all this. Meanwhile, The children wonder why they should have to walk this predetermined path. Deep down inside, they feel that working for a good company won't actually bring them happiness. Despite their parents' constant nagging, the children wonder why they should have to study so hard. Some people hope that if they just work to overcome their present difficulty, they'll find great happiness, but these children don't feel any such hope. 
they come to a stop and ask themselves, why should I have to struggle so hard on this path when it all seems pointless anyway? This is what leads them to stop attending school and become shut-ins. However, that painful time may unexpectedly provide them with a chance to think about life. It gives them a chance to notice something that they wouldn't have noticed if they'd been preoccupied with besting their rivals on that path that others had decided for them. It gives them an opportunity to question what the point of that path is and what the meaning of life is. Prince Siddhartha was just the same, and he kept getting lost in deep thought. The king started wondering how he could cheer his son up and he came up with the idea of giving him four seasonal palaces where five hundred beautiful women would wait upon him. So Prince Siddhartha had palaces for spring, summer, autumn, and winter, almost like four seasonal theme parks where five hundred beautiful women would be at his service. There he could have as much fun as he wished. Prince Siddhartha was able to indulge in pleasure and forget his worries for a time, but then something made him start thinking about the purpose of life again. Eventually, he would leave the palace in search of the answer. In a sense, he dropped out of the path his father and everyone else had placed their hopes on for him and decided to pursue his own path. The former prince would then go on to discover the real purpose of life and dedicate the rest of his life to conveying that purpose to us. What he taught is known today as Buddhism, the teachings of Buddha. And so it is precisely people who have taken that time out in life to ponder what it is that they really should be doing who ought to listen to the Buddhist teaching. Many shut-ins feel as if they are of no value like trash and that they are just a burden on society, of no use whatsoever. They may feel as if all they do is make their parents worry and suffer, and that others would be better off without them, meaning they think it'd be better if they'd never been born, or if they'd hurry up and die. In other words, they don't know what the purpose of their lives is, or what meaning there is in them being alive. Buddhism calls this darkness of mind. Before attaining enlightenment, Prince Siddhartha himself struggled with this, so it's not only the specific segment of society that becomes shut-ins who deals with this. You're not alone. In fact, Buddhism teaches that everyone has this darkness of mind. Sakyamuni Buddha taught that no one has true clarity on what it is that we live for. Upon hearing this, you might think, hang on, that's not true. I know what I live for. You might also have never thought yourself to be worthless or like you'd be better off dead. But feelings shift and change, and just as Prince Siddhartha could only stay distracted from his troubles for a time, your own darkness of mind is only temporarily hidden deep within you. Perhaps you are deeply immersed in something you enjoy, or focus squarely on your job, or just otherwise too busy, but something is just preventing you from noticing that darkness. Buddhism makes clear that it's there within you, just covered over for now. Once your present fixation ends, you will suddenly be hit with a sense of emptiness as darkness of mind emerges hazily from within. There is no one who doesn't have darkness of mind. It'll become apparent to you when something makes you come to a stop, like being unable to go to work, being fired, resigning, or having to spend your days in hospital because of a serious illness. Buddhism is actually all about becoming aware of our darkness of mind and resolving it. At the beginning of teaching, practice, faith, enlightenment, Master Shinrin said, the unimpeded light is the sun of wisdom that destroys darkness of mind. So Buddhism's focus is entirely on this darkness of mind. Master Shinran said that Buddhism is the sun of wisdom that destroys darkness of mind. He taught that Buddhism is the wisdom that eliminates ignorance regarding why we live and frees us of our inner emptiness. Master Shinran himself experienced being troubled by darkness of mind, 
but had it resolved thanks to the Buddhist teachings. He therefore wanted to convey to us that we, too, can have our darkness resolved by Buddhism, the Son of Wisdom. The Song of Pure Land Shin Buddhism, a piece that Shin Buddhists are deeply familiar with, has a part that goes like this. I have been saved and freed from eternal darkness. Nothing can compare to this profound joy that fills my heart. Eternal darkness here refers to darkness of mind. This is our ignorance regarding what we were born for, the ailment that can leave a person sighing despondently and wishing they'd never been born. Though we have long been burdened with it, we too can be freed from this darkness and attain real joy in this life. It's now, while we are still alive, that darkness of mind can be eliminated. Then, filled with transcendent absolute happiness, we will be unable to help but marvel that nothing can compare to this profound joy that fills my heart. This is what the song tells us. Another well-known Buddhist quote expresses awe at this extraordinary happiness. Human form is difficult to obtain. Now I have already obtained it. What this tells you is that you too can obtain joy that will make you marvel in delight at the rare gift that is being born human. Buddhism teaches that even someone who resents being born and wishes themselves dead can attain such powerful clarity and peace that they rejoice at being alive and know without a doubt that their life has meaning, that they were born precisely to attain this wondrous state. I hope that for those of you who are shut-ins right now, your time struggling with this condition leads to you developing a bond with Buddhism, and that through Buddhism you are able to attain everlasting absolute happiness and peace of mind. Thank you for watching today's video.